My name is Douglas Griffin. This is uh, my Sunday school class. I am teaching in the book of Exodus. Oh, today's March 26, 2023. Uh, we've been going through the Bible. We started in Genesis a couple years ago. We're in Exodus chapter 15, where God is on Mount Sinai explaining all of his commandments uh, to the people. And uh, today in chapter 15, let's see how I can, how can do that. There we go. Uh, we're starting in, I made that up. On Wednesdays, I'm in John chapter 15. I'm in Exodus chapter 23. Sorry. Exodus chapter 23. Um, and so we're starting with the 10th verse. Oh, again. My apologies to those who are no, used to this coming on at 9.05. Uh, I got up early enough just so that uh, it could actually be on time. Hi, Susie. Uh, so, it says six years, this is starting with verse 10 of Exodus chapter 23. Six years, oh, so, first God gave the commandments with consequence and kind of what we would call case law. If this happens, if you see your neighbor and you go up to him and stab him in the heart, you will get 20 years hard sentence. It tells you exactly, it describes exactly what type of thing might happen, and exactly what the punishment should be. Uh, now God's in a section where he's simply telling them, I'm watching you. I need you to do these things. I'm watching you, and I'm going to give the consequence. So the consequences that the community needs to give, that's important to the community, that they all recognize this is a bad thing, and this is how we're all pulling together. And it was a lot about, I defined it uh, as love your neighbor. It's, it's how to treat the person next door, the person down the street, the stranger who comes to the land, your servants, uh, whoever around you, your mother and father, all these people, how, how we should treat each other as a community and then what the community needs to do to bring uh, the punishment. And so sometimes it's important that the community, uh, that this happens in front of the community because it helps teach us what's right and wrong. Now God is saying, here's some things that maybe nobody sees you do. Last week, he, he gave, God gave an example of you see your neighbor's mule and you know he's escaped, but you don't like your neighbor because he's been cruel to you you still have to go find his mule and take it back to him. Even though nobody saw it, you can walk by, his mule is hurt or dying or whatever. You could walk by, no one would see you. But God basically says, I see you, so therefore I need you to uh, do the right thing. And these are, so here are the consequences I'm going to bring if you don't do the right thing. So he started with, here's the consequences that the community is going to bring because the community saw you do it. Um, but here are, the, here are the things that I see you do, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to personally bring. And he doesn't tell you what the consequences are. He just says, I'm the Lord. So just know I'm watching you. Now he's talking about the laws of the Sabbaths, and he's talking more generally about the community again, but what the community is doing that I see you do, and how I might judge the whole community if you do not do these things. Um, so in Exodus chapter 23, verse 10, and I'm calling, this is Sabbaths and feasts, and feasts, and there's ways that God wants us to commemorate what he has done. We tend to commemorate things just because, especially in church, just because it's a tradition to do that. But God's teaching us something about himself. I want you to commemorate these things and do these things in a way so that you can learn more about my personality and how I operate. So I want you to keep these certain rituals because they're teaching you about me, not because I just like seeing you do them. Like, ooh, I love it when you wear red. I just wear red, red every time you get. He's not just having you do stuff because it's fun. He, there's a purpose in these things because it's teaching us about him. Okay, so Exodus chapter 23. Um, now let me go back and make sure I'm still centered. All right. Exodus chapter 23, verse 10 says, Six years you shall sow your land and gather in its produce. And 99% of the people there are farmers. That's how they're eating. Back in the day when you didn't go to the grocery store, everybody grew their own groceries. 
And so how successful you were at sowing and reaping and paying attention to the flock often determined your success in life. If you were very diligent and you took care of the land and then you'd have a lot of crop. If you were lazy, then you didn't have much crop and then you weren't able to pay your bills. And Okay, so six years you shall sow your land and gather in its produce. But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow. Don't do anything to it, period. That the poor of your people may eat. And what they leave, the beasts of the fields may eat. In like manner you shall do with your vineyard and your olive grove. So not just the crop, not just the wheat, but also your grapes, your olive grove. And again, the purpose is they're going to be poor. They're going to be people who make mistakes or who've been disadvantaged in some way. So either not their fault or was their fault. Either way, God says, let them, don't, don't take in the produce. Don't even take it in. It's not like, well, you mean I can't plant? No, don't do anything. Just whatever is there, allow the poor to come because God's concerned about them. And if, and if they lose hope and the poor think, I'm never going to catch up, God's aware that that makes them more destitute, that makes them more of a burden on society. So that he wants them to know that they have hope. If, we want to change, if you want to change them, uh, they can't think, I'll never have anything again, I'm just going to be, because I'll just go live on the street and just let my life go to waste. So uh, the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow that the poor people may eat. Now, he goes into more detail in Leviticus, so Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, when I get to Leviticus, where, where he, God goes in more detail because he's, he constructs a, the, temp, uh, the tabernacle in Leviticus, and he tells them very specifically each law that the priests are supposed to administer and why, etc. So we'll get to Leviticus in a couple years. In Leviticus chapter 25, verse 1 through 6. And the Lord spoke, no, verse 1 through 3. I made that up. Let me put a three there. Um, and the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I gave you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. So the land needs to have a Sabbath. Um, and he'd mentioned this before in the first Ten Commandments. On the sixth day, I rested from my labor, so you need to rest from your labor. And you make that day holy in that you only do what I tell you to do in that day. It's not a day where you do nothing. You just sit and stare. But you don't worry about, I've got to plan. I've got to do <laughs> Give yourself a rest because that's a sign of faith that you're believing God's going to take care of you that day. Now, you know he's been taking care of you, but you think, well, he took care of me because I did all this stuff. I need a day where you don't do anything, only what I tell you. So he's trying to establish a certain principle, trying to teach them faith. Uh, now he says, I need this land to have a Sabbath where you trust me on the seventh year and you don't do anything. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come to the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. By the way, there's a scientific principle that the land has to, if you just keep parching the land and it just grows dry after a while and so you're really supposed to give it rest but we'd all be too panicked to do no I can't. we got to keep it. and then we wonder why certain things just go barren after a while okay so verse three six years you shall sow your field and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit but in the seventh year there shall be a sabbath of solemn rest for the land a sabbath to the lord you shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard what grows of its own accord of your harvest you shall not reap nor gather the grapes of your untended vine, for it is a year of rest for the land. And he's basically saying, I'm, I'm, he says in a different place, what I give you in the sixth year will be enough. So you don't have to worry about it. The biggest 25, verse 18. So you shall observe my statutes and keep my judgments and perform them, and you will dwell in the land in safety. Meaning if you don't, you won't dwell in safety. Then the land will yield its fruit, and you will eat your fill and dwell there in safety. And, and if you say, well, what shall we eat in the seventh year, since we shall not sow nor gather in our produce? <laughs> then I will command my blessings on you in the sixth year, and it will bring forth produce enough for three years. So it will cover you in the sixth year, cover you in the seventh year, cover you in the eighth year. So you have not only enough for the sixth year, but the seventh, eighth, and ninth. Okay, for three years. And you shall sow in the eighth year and eat old produce until the ninth year, meaning old produce from the sixth. 
even though you're sowing in the eighth, you can keep sowing, you're going to still have an abundance left over from year six. And you'll eat old produce until the ninth year. Until its produce comes in, you shall eat of the old harvest. Because you're saying, but if I don't, in the, if I don't sow for a year in the seventh year, in the eighth year, now I'm sowing, I have to wait the entire year for the produce to come in. So I'm sowing in March. I have to wait till October for the produce to come in. He says, don't worry. What I give you in the sixth year will cover your seven. It'll cover your eight. It'll cover your nine. Don't even worry. So uh, you should eat of the old produce, produce until the ninth year, until its produce comes in, and you shall eat of the old harvest. So that's a way of trusting God. Okay, so I'm just not going to, it's like tithing. Okay, I'm going to trust God. Um, he likes it. He says, I will reward you for that. Now, so there's seven years, right? Six years you, pro, you reap, and on the seventh year, and earlier he said, in the seventh year, you are to let your, uh, so if you, um, someone owes you money, and the way they've just chosen to pay you back is to work for you for seven years. You let you work them for the seventh for six years, and in the seventh, you forgive their debt, even if they still owe you. They owe you twelve years worth of six years in the seventh year. They need to know that they can go back to their life and start over. People need to know that. And in in countries where there are bankruptcy laws that allow people, to, where they know there's a safety net for them. People are more uh, adventurous, they, they, they invest more, they take more chances, they do more things, because they know, well, if I mess up, I've got this safety net. In countries where there isn't, obviously people are afraid to ever take any kind of chance, because if I mess up, that's it, they're going to kick me out. So uh, God's trying to establish, I need people to know, not, you can be reckless and just do anything you want and be crazy, but I want you to have faith. But if something messes up, there is a re there's redemption in year seven. Um, so now in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 25 says, if one of your brethren becomes poor and insults him of his possession to pay his debt, and if his redeeming relative comes to redeem it, then he may redeem it what his brother sold. So he sells it to you in order to pay his debt. Uh, if his redeeming relative comes to buy it, you got to sell it to him so that he can get it back. He doesn't have the money to get it back. When a relative comes back, you can't say, no, it's mine now. Sorry. God's about redemption. Uh, verse 26, or if the man has no one to redeem it, but he himself becomes able to redeem it, like he finally makes enough money, then let him count the years since its sale and restore the remainder to the man to whom he sold it, that he may return to his possession. So he has to let him buy it back, but he has to count the years since it's sale. Like, okay, it's been three years worth of stuff. I've worked for you all this time, and so I owe you this much more. Uh, so I'm going to pay you back that much more. You know, the remainder. Uh, restore the remainder to the man to whom he sold it that he may return to his possession. Given back, like his house, right? I'm so poor now. I'm going to have to live with you. You can buy my house. Uh, but I've worked for you three na years now, so count that off the price. Because now I can buy back my house, and but I've you know I've already paid you a certain amount just in my own wages, my working for you. Verse twenty-eight says, "But if he's not able to have restored it to himself, then what was sold shall remain in the hand of him who bought it." It's like until the year of jubilee, and in the jubilee it shall be released, and he shall return to his possession. So now he's going to talk about the year of Jubilee. That's different than the Sabbath year. In the seventh year, he gets to leave your service. But if he sold you his house, it doesn't automatically return to him in the seventh year. You have, he has to wait until the year of Jubilee. Then every man can return to his possession. So if you bought his land or whatever. So what's the year of Jubilee? 99% of you out there are, I already know this, but I have to read it for the 1%. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 8 says, And you shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times seven years. So every seven years, person goes free. Every seven years, you don't plant. Every seven years, redemption, you just let the poor come in and eat your stuff because God's blessed you in the six years for three years worth of stuff. So you, it's okay if the poor come in and eat because you have enough for three years. 
But he says seven times those, seven, 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 49 years have gone by. Seven times seven years, and the time of the seventh Sabbath of years shall be to you 49 years. So seven sevens. Verse 9 of Leviticus chapter 25 says, Then you shall cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement. You shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land. He's timing it on the day of atonement because that's the day when we are redeemed. We're on the day of atonement, the priests go in to the holy of holies. Right. They've been going in every day for just daily sins, but on the, now he's going in for sins we didn't account for, sins we didn't recognize, things we didn't even know. Everything's forgiven on the Day of Atonement, washed away. So just like I'm forgiving you on the Day of Atonement, you have to forgive others their debts. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who trespass against us. Right? We forgive our debtors. So just, in the, just like I'm doing to you, you have to do to other people. If you don't, Jesus says, neither I won't forgive yours, then I'll let consequences come on you. Because I invented sowing and reaping, God is saying. So if you sow mercy, you'll get back mercy. If you sow judgment, you get back judgment. You can't even be shocked. Why is everybody judging me? Because you judge. Why is nobody speaking to me? Because you don't speak to anybody. Why is everybody yelling at me? Because you yell. <laughs> so what you put out comes back. Again, one crazy person may run up and and grab you. That doesn't mean that you grab everybody. But in general, if everybody's doing something back to you, you got to look at yourself and say, well, I must be putting that out because everybody's bringing that back to me. Um, okay. So, then you shall cause the trumpet jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land. And you shall consecrate the fiftieth year. So, six years, seven years. Six years on the seventh jubilee. Say, so, even on the 49th year, there's a Sabbath rest. And then I'm giving you an extra year on the 50th year. Here's what's going to happen. You shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. And each of you shall return to his possession. And each of you shall return to his family. So you haven't been able to buy back your house for 50 years. It goes back to your family now. Uh, everybody gets their stuff back. Yeah, but I rightfully, but, but you shouldn't have. I want everybody to have their own stuff. And we hear stories uh, today of people who were cheated out of things years ago or stuff was taken from them, and people are restoring it. Here, you get to, this, should, this was wrongfully taken from you. Uh, we put you in a Japanese internment camp and took your house from you. We're going to give you that house back. We, we wrongfully did that. We said no blacks can own any land in Manhattan Beach, which happened. And so we're just going to take your land from you. Okay, we're giving it back. Uh, so that's not some horrible uh, liberal thing or something. God's, however it was taken, and in these cases because you couldn't pay your debt. That's why it was taken. 50 years, give it back because... People need to be able to start again. God's not interested in people being eternally poor, eternally in debt. They need to be able to start again. Same with us. He's not interested in us being eternally in debt to him. Uh, some people are afraid. Would that encourage people just to sin if God forgives? Well, he's hoping that the love that he's showing you actually will change your heart and you won't want to sin. But, he's t but knowing, thinking that you're just going to be constantly in debt to God, that God hates you, that's certainly going to keep you on the street. That's going to keep the people who are eternally depressed. They see no hope for their lives. They're just drinking themselves to death. They're just wasting away because they have lost all hope of any redemption. You can bring them in for a day and they'll go right back out the street because they just don't believe it's going to work anymore. God knows in his principles we can't live like that. We have to know that there's some redemption, that ultimately we're forgiven, that we're not just going to get head, head over the head, hit over the head again for the same sin over and over and over and over again. Uh, there's got to be some redemption. Uh, so, so that's why God says, as far as the east is from the west, have I forgiven your sin? Don't worry about it because that's going to help you move on into a more full life as opposed to always thinking God's angry at us. That's going to keep us depressed and that keeps people sinning. Um, just one second. Oh, hi. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So, and you shall consecrate, this is verse 10, you shall consecrate 
the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you and each of you shall return to his possession and each of you shall return to his family. Verse 11, that 50th year shall be a jubilee to you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of its own accord, nor gather the grapes of your untended vine. So I will give you enough in year 48, because already t in 49 you can't do it, because that's a seven year. That's why I'm giving you enough in the sixth year to cover three years. Don't even do it in the year of Jubilee. J well, wh who's it for then? For it's a Jubilee, it shall be holy to you, you shall eat its produce from the field that I previously given you. In this year of Jubilee, each of you should return to his possession. And all of you open your doors to the poor. And every So you've been poor for a long time. Now you've got your house back. Don't even you eat what's on your land. Open your to those who have nothing for a year. And that will encourage them. They'll go out and do good. And they'll become uh, successful parts of society. Now, these rules, God's saying, I'm not going to tell you what the punishment is if you don't follow it. I'm just telling you, you better follow them. So I told you specifically what the community should do. But now I'm giving you rules. I see what you're doing. I, no one else saw you sneak out in your land and start eating some grapes. No one else saw you come in in the middle of the night and start planting. But I see you. So I'm going to give you the consequence for your actions if you do not do what I says, says, what I said. In Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 11, it says, And I gave them my statutes and I showed them my judgments which if a man does, he shall live by them. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. So I'm, I'm doing this so they get me. I want you to understand me and that I'm the, I'm the one helping you. I'm the one blessing you. So I, I, I want them to do nothing on the Sabbath other than whatever I tell them to do. Um, yet, verse 13 of Ezekiel 20. Yet the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statutes. They despised my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. I, that's my rule. If you're going you're gonna to do this, you got to live by it. You, you don't get to do it whenever you feel like it and then not doing it today. I'm going to do it tomorrow, but I'm not going to do it. If you buy in, you got to buy in all the way. And they greatly defiled my Sabbaths. Then I said I would pour out my fury on them in the wilderness to consume them, which I did. So in the wilderness, they weren't listening to me. So that's why that group never entered into the promised land, because they didn't, in the wilderness, they didn't do what I said. <laughs> and they had just come out of Egypt. They had just seen the Red Sea part. They'd just seen all these things happen. So uh, again, this is about faith. There's a reason to take these Sabbaths. There's a reason to do these things because we have to show God we believe so we can be generous. It's okay to be generous because if you're generous, I'll repay you, the Bible says, right? Now, he, he gave them, you're supposed to, every seven years, do not let the land grow fallow. They didn't do that. Once, even once they got to the uh, promised land because they were afraid. I better sow that seventh year because what if God doesn't come through? And that's why, that's where our worry stems from. What if God doesn't come through? Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So they're being punished, and he's making it exactly 70 years. So they did something wrong. God doesn't just leave them into captivity just for the fun of it. Then it will come to pass when seven years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation. So I'm going to allow these infidels to come and take you into captivity. And I'm going to punish them because they're, they're worse than you. But I'm going to use them to punish you. And the land of the Chaldeans for their iniquity, says the Lord. And I will make it a perpetual desolation. So I, they'll be bad. In Second Chronicles, so it's like, why were they in, why was it 70 years? Why that amount? In Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 19, it says, uh, and this describes what happened when the Babylonians came in. It says, then they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all its palaces with fire, and destroyed all its precious possessions. Babylonians came in and did all this stuff. And those who escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, where they became servants to him and his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia. 
Uh, so Babylon is modern day Iraq. Persia is modern day Iran. So first the Iraqans grabbed them and then the Iranians took over and they're actually the ones who released them ultimately. So why did this happen? Verse 21 of 2 Chronicles 36. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. And it, it goes on to explain that they did not, for 490 years, they, never, they didn't observe that Sabbath thing. So they owed God 70 years of letting the land stay desolate. 490 years until they were taken into captivity. For that 70 times, they did not observe that seventh year. They planted because they were scared. We got to plant it this year. God says, I need, this is a Sabbath for the land. I need the land to lay deb, lay des to have no planting going on it. Let it breathe. It's producing and producing and producing. It needs a break. Your body needs a break. We all need a break here. Right? It's just going, 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 going. going. Got to stop. So, uh, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, as long as she lay desperate, she kept Sabbath. Because I told my new Sabbath to fulfill seven years. So there's for 490 years they didn't do it. So it's like you owe me for 70 years of the land. Just like so, I'm gonna take you off the land. Because the they could have come in and occupied the land they were in. They still would have been planting. Nope, I gotta take you away from the land so that for 70 years it can just lie still and get its rest. Okay. Back to Exodus chapter 23. So again, God says, I, I'll bring the punishment if you don't observe these. Exodus chapter 23, verse 12. It says, six days you shall do your work, and we're familiar with this. And on the seventh day you shall rest. So he did a seven-year thing. He did a seven times 70, a 40, a seven times seven, a 49-year. On the fifth year of his year of Jubilee, now he's going back and reminding us about seven days. And on the seventh day you rest. Six days you shall do your work, and on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey may rest. So not just so that you keep it holy and, and that I'm, you're telling me what to do. I need your ox and your donkey to have a day off. And the son of your female servant, because I know that your female servant, you're, you're not making her plow in the field because you don't believe that women can do that. But the son, she, he, I need him to have a day off. I need your servant to have a day off. And the stranger, so and the foreigner, who is um, who's working for you, they need a day off. So they may be refreshed. So I'm doing this because you you would work them to death. Uh, so no but no working. Don't work your servants. Give them the day off. Give them the day off. In Exodus chapter twenty, verse eight through eleven, uh, we're just reviewing. He had said that. Uh, so part of the reason, again, is to just give your servants a day off. And just reminding us in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. He says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, which means consecrated to me. Uh, if I tell you, though, to pull your donkey out of the ditch, you can do that. If I tell you go to bake a pie for your neighbor, you can do whatever I'm telling you. But this is a day where you're totally doing whatever I tell, I tell you to do. That's what keeping the day holy means. Some people think it just means wear white and sit in a corner and do nothing. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, or the guy from another place who's living with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he hallowed it. He, he didn't rest because he ran out of stuff to do. He rested and hallowed it on purpose, made it holy, hallowed it, made it holy, so that we can follow that example. Uh, Exodus chapter 23, verse 13. And in all that I have said to you, be circumspect, and make no mention of the name of other gods, nor let it be heard from your mouth. So everything I'm saying, you, be, you, better, you need to listen, and don't say, well, it's, those other gods, they don't demand this, and... When they, they worship Baal, Baal says you can work all day long. Don't even mention any other gods. I don't want to hear it. Okay, now, Exodus chapter 23, verse 14. Uh, 
Three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. So there's three feasts you must keep. First, he's going to tell us about the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. Feast of the Unleavened Bread. We know it as Passover, right? We already know the circumstance. They were in Egypt. They put blood on the door. And then the angel of the Lord passed over them because he saw the blood of the lamb, right? We already know what that symbol is. But the other thing he wanted to observe is the Feast of Unleavened Bread because leaven is a type of sin. When you put leaven, it leavens the whole lump. So don't put any leaven in. Don't, don't raise it. Don't inflate it. I just want it plain. And I'm calling it the Feast of Unleavened Bread because it's more about the sin than about the blood. You don't have to duplicate the blood every year. He didn't want them to. So every year I want you to take blood and put it on your doorstep. No, every year I want you to not leaven any bread. So you, because it's about your sin and you, you choosing not to sin. Um, so this happened in Abib, the month of Abib. So another, draws we say Nisan, but that's March, April. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 16, it describes all the three feasts in detail. Here in Exodus chapter 23, it just says, don't forget the three feasts. But let's go a little detail into them. Um, and again, Deuteronomy is the summation. When they were leaving the wilderness, after 40 years, they're about to leave the wilderness. God said, let's just sum up everything we've learned the past 40 years. And so they go into greater detail to clarify certain things. In Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 1, it says, Observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover to the Lord your God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. Therefore you shall sacrifice the Passover to the Lord your God from the flock and the herd in the place where the Lord chooses to put his name. Uh, so wherever I send you, I want you to do it there. Ultimately, this began to happen in Jerusalem at the temple that was built there, and they would all bring their lambs to be slaughtered. Again, they didn't necessarily go home and put blood over the door, but they slaughtered the lamb, the lamb's blood is shed, and then there were certain things they were supposed to observe. Uh, but at this point, they're just doing it all in their households. So here's what you want, I want you to do, verse 3 of Deuteronomy 16. You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread with it. That is the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, so you didn't have time to leave it. I want you to remember your affliction. I want you to remember how you felt in Egypt and remember your sin that brought you there. Some people don't teach that inadvertently. They don't because they think that God wanted them in Egypt or something. When God wanted them in the Holy Land, he sent them to Egypt on purpose. When he brought famine on the entire world, only Joseph was able to solve this for the world. Only Joseph knew in advance it was going to happen. And, and uh, Egypt was the world center. And all the nations, all surrounding nations, were going to come to Egypt and say, how did you guys know about this famine? How did you store up food for seven years? Uh, because Joseph, his God, told him. So God used that famine as advertisement for the children of Israel. And then they were supposed to go back, but they decided to stay in Egypt. So he says, so see how you were afflicted in Egypt? I want you to remember your affliction, remember your sin. I told you not to put any leaven in the bread. You, were, you had to leave in a hurry. You don't even have time to leaven it. And it represents your affliction, your mistake. Not, I want you to remember how people treated you bad. I want you to remember how you got in trouble because of your mistakes. That you may remember the day in which you came out of the land of Egypt all the days of your life. And how I brought you out. So see how you got in trouble and I brought you out. God wants you to remember how you were on drugs or how you were doing all this terrible stuff. And I brought you out. Let's commemorate your salvation. Uh, and no leaven shall be seen among you in all your territory for seven days. Nor shall any of the, of the meat which you sacrificed the first day at twilight remain overnight until morning. Got to eat that meat right away. Don't let it sit. Okay, we're going to eat the lamb. Get that in us. Don't leaven that bread. And then you're out. And, and these are specific lessons that I want you to learn about me and remember where you were in and how I brought you out. Because now that you're out, you forget. And when you see people also in their sin, 
There's a way that you treat them, but you don't remember that you were in Egypt too and you got brought out. That's why I want you to treat the, changer, the stranger in your land a certain way. Because I don't want you to forget and start looking down on people like you've always been incredible because you have not. And so I want you to remember your affliction because there's three feasts and they all play off of each other. There's three lessons that we're supposed to learn about our salvation and how we're supposed to treat other people. In verse 5 of Deuteronomy chapter 16, we're going into these details. Is You may not sacrifice the Passover within any of your gates which the Lord your God gives you. Uh, but at the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide, there you shall sacrifice the Passover twilight at the going down of the sun at the time you came out of Egypt. So it's got to be in the place where I'm sending you, then you can celebrate. So don't celebrate your, it's like don't celebrate your salvation in the, at the drug house. Don't, oh, I'm saved, are you? Good. So don't do it where you want, do it where I send you. Um, verse 7, and you shall roast and eat it in the place where the Lord your God chooses, and in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. Then you can go back, but I'm going to, there's going to be a place where you all celebrate it, right? Six days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a sacred assembly to the Lord your God. You shall do no work on it. So, at first they had to do it in their homes, but then he said, now do it at the tent. Then finally David built a tabernacle, or I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to give you a place to do it. They started in their home, but at, this is as they're leaving, as they're leaving. He says, now no longer do it in your homes. I'm going to give you a place to do it. Um, the next, so it says three feasts. The second feast is the Feast of Harvest. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Harvest, we would call that the Feast of Pentecost, or the Festival of Weeks, 49 weeks. There's a 50th week, 49 days, the 50th day, the Festival of Pentecost. For them, this happened when the law came down on Mount Sinai, and they saw the power of God and the cloud and all of that. That was the day of Pentecost, the 50th day that, since they had left. I want you to celebrate that day because it also happened to be the day of the first fruits of the harvest. Um, it, it happens at the beginning of the summer uh, in May when the wheat crop has been reaped. And it's uh, so there's two things. I'm giving you the law and I'm giving you the first. I'm coming down on the mountain, giving you my presence, offering you my presence, saving you offering you my presence in your life on the same day that you the first fruits of it. This is when the wheat crop, the wheat crop came up first. And the other produce didn't happen until the fall. So in Deuteronomy chapter 16, he explains this starting in verse 9. It says, you shall count seven weeks for yourself. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time that you begin to put the sickle in the grain. So as soon as you plant, when the first harvest comes up, when the wheat harvest comes up, 49 weeks from that time to that. Uh, then you shall keep the Feast of Weeks to the Lord your God with the tribute of a freewill offering from your hand, which you shall give as the Lord your God blesses you. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, the Levite who is within your gates, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow who are among you. Everybody rejoices at the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. And you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and you should be careful to observe these statutes. So I'm still... This was 50 days after you were in Egypt. I still want you to remember who you were and where you were, that you were in sin. But now I'm giving you my presence, my spirit, and the first fruits. Because you planted way back when you, during Passover, you planted, or maybe even before Passover. But now you're starting to reap your first harvest. And so in the Bible corresponding, obviously Jesus died on Passover. Uh, but the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down on the disciples. And that's when the first fruits came, those first uh, couple, several thousand to four, two to four thousand people were saved on that day. That's the first fruits. Look how, how God's doing that. But then there's a third festival. That's the Feast of Ingathering. So we have the fest Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Festival of Weeks, or, or you call it the Feast of Harvest. Now the in-gathering, because you're gathering all the other, the, the grapes, the olives, everything else. Everybody now comes in. So I gave you the first fruits, but now everybody comes in. Um, in Deuteronomy 16, chapter, uh, verse 13, then you shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles. So this feast happens, um, 
at a time, like in Jerusalem, I don't know if you remember when, when in the book of John, when we're going through the book of John, it says on the last great day of the feast, and he's talking about the Feast of Tabernacles, because there's everybody there has brought their tent in to Jerusalem. They're commemorating their time in the wilderness when they were always in tents. Everybody was in a tent. So I want you to, even though you have a house now, and it's 500 years later or 1,000 years later, I want you to remember that you were in tents in the wilderness. So, so they all bring their tents to, uh, to Jerusalem. And on that last day, Jesus says, because, and they would pour out the water. And he says, I'm that living water now. I'm that living water that you're celebrating on this last, at this third festival, this festival of tabernacles or, or, or tents, where you're commemorating your time in the wilderness. Um, so he says in, in Deuteronomy 16, 13, you shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days when you have gathered from your threshing floor and from your wine press. So you, this is, everybody's coming in now. Correspondingly, I get saved, uh, the power of God comes upon me and the Pentecost, and then, and we have the first fruits of people getting saved, but now, I'm sorry, on Passover, Jesus, we can remember what Jesus did then now his blessing comes upon me and I'm the first fruits, but now I'm reaching out to everybody. So all the harvest is coming in. So I want you to, the reason I want you to remember that you were slaves in Egypt, because I want you to look at those people and say, oh, they're still slaves in Egypt too. They need to be delivered. So you didn't get saved for you. You got saved so that you can help somebody else. So I'm, tr I'm training you with these three feasts to remember you were a slave in Egypt. I brought you out. Then the power came down on the mountain, and now you're to go out and help other people at the same time because I'm corresponding it to the planting, the first harvest, and then the ingathering of all the harvests. So first you've got to see, plant the seed, then you see the first fruit spring up, but now all the harvest is ready to be brought in, and that's how you just look at your life in those three phases as far as salvation is conf confirmed. He planted the seed in my heart, then he poured out a spirit on me, and now he wants to be that river, living water flowing out to everybody else through me. That's why Jesus on that last great day of the feast stood up and said, and I'm that river of water, that's me flowing out of you now to everybody to be a healing for the nations. And you shall rejoice in your feast, your son, everybody, okay, blah, 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 blah. Uh, seven days, verse 15, seven days you shall keep a sacred feast to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord chooses because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands so that you surely rejoice. Three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses. This is Deuteronomy chapter 16, I'm in verse 16. At the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, at the Feast of Tabernacles. So three times a year you must go and by the time, by Jesus' time, it was the place he chose was in Jerusalem, the temple in Jerusalem. So three times a year, Jesus went to Jerusalem. Then he left Jerusalem because the, the, the Pharisees were going to attack them, and he would go back up north of Jerusalem because people were receiving them there. The, the only time he stayed in Jerusalem, and we're, discuss, we're going through this on Wednesdays in the book of John, was the last time he came uh, for the Festival of Weeks, which happens in like October. Professor, I mean not weeks, of tabernacles, the last time he came there, and, and, and the people, he, they were all in tents and all that stuff, and that's one reason why Jesus said to him, let not your heart to be troubled, I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my father's house, there's, there's a lot of dwelling places. Everybody's crowded, they're all in Jerusalem, and they're all crowded, and it looks like there's no room for us. In my father's house, there's plenty of room. So he's responding to what the disciples were seeing. So he stays from the festival of tabernacles in October. He stays there all that time until the next Passover. Uh, but other than that, he would come for seven days and he would leave because he's a good Jew who's doing what he's supposed to do. And he says, uh, three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses. That was the temple at Jesus' time, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is Passover, the Feast of Weeks, which is Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed, bring an offering, Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. I don't know if you remember, but Jesus showed up at one time. The people came to Peter and said, is Jesus going to give an offering? He's not going to give an offering? And Jesus said, uh, I'm God. You need to be giving offerings to me. 
I'm, why would I give an offering? Why would I give an offering? Uh, so, uh, but he sent Peter to this fish, and not that the fish was hanging out. He, <laughs> he, he sent Peter to the water, and he went fishing, and he caught a fish, and it had a coin in his mouth. And said, Give that to them, so, so, just so we can go ahead and fulfill the law. But I want to be clear, I'm God, you need to be giving me an offering. Okay, Exodus chapter 23. Verse 15 and 16, and these are the last few verses we're going to read is 15 through 19. So you shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib. Back in March at Pentecost, three festivals. Um, I mean at Passover. Back in the month of Abib, or Nisan sometimes it was called. Back in March, I told you eat unleavened bread. I want you to eat unleavened bread each time that you celebrate this feast, whether it is Passover Pentecost or the Feast of Tabernacles, eat unleavened bread so you remember your affliction because you can get so rich and so prosperous that you forget that other people are suffering. Uh, and God never forgets. You shall keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib. For in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. Bring an offering. Recognize that I'm the one that brought you out and be grateful. And the Feast of Harvest, which is that third feast, uh, the first, no, that's the second one. Sorry, Feast of Harvest is the second one because they harvest the first fruits. So, and the Feast of Harvest, the first fruits of your labors, which you have sown in the field, and the Feast of Ingathering, the Feast of Tabernacles, that third one, at the end of the year when you've gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field. So you get the first fruits of the wheat, and then all the other produce comes in. And again, there were 4,000 who were saved on the day of Pentecost, but then they went out and they went and spread the gospel all over the world. So he says, I'm going to have you do these things because I want to get this picture in your mind. Don't forget you came from Egypt. Don't get so prosperous that you forget that. And I want to remind you that you were in tents. You were in the wilderness. You didn't have homes. So every year, the third festival, show up in Jerusalem in tents. Don't forget that I'm the one that brought you out so, so that you can have a compassion for other people who possibly, maybe they're living in tents, maybe they don't have homes. So I want you for just one week to uh, live poor. People do that sometimes. They'll, they'll take, uh, I want to show you, I want to help build empathy for you. So for the next uh, two or three days, we, you know, we're not going to eat or something. So you can just see, here's how people who live on the street feel, or I'm going to take you to the desert, I don't know, sometimes they just want to just build empathy in people, see how this feels. So when you see these people, I want you to know how they're feeling so that you have some empathy for them, and that's what God was trying to do. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, three times in the year all your males shall appear before the Lord. Exodus chapter 23, verse 18, you shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, nor shall the fat of my sacrifice remain until the morning. So two things. It's all got to be done. Uh, it's accomplishing two things. Do not leaven your bread. I want you to be aware of your sin. And the sacrifice has to be gone in a night because Jesus was crucified and it was all accomplished in one moment. So I'm trying to teach you that the lamb must be consumed instantly because he, and, and again, Jesus didn't linger. They took him immediately off the cross, right? And he was already accomplishing that work. I don't want it to linger into the morning uh, so that you get this picture in your head. Yeah, that lamb must be gone instantly. Oh, look, Jesus was gone instantly. I wonder if he's the lamb. Because I'm trying to help you identify Jesus when he shows up so that you don't get confused. Okay. Uh, and the last verse I'm doing today is verse 19. The first fruits, no, the first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. I will start there uh, 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 next week. So we'll start with verse 19 uh, because then that's a different, that starts to go into, God starts to go into a different thing. Okay, so what have we learned? We, he, first he talks about the Sabbaths. Giving the land uh, once, uh, first a Sabbath week. On the seventh day, you're going to rest and, and because that's good for your faith. It's also good for your servants, people who work for you, and recognize I'm going to give you enough on the sixth day to cover that seventh day. Then seven years. 
uh, on the seventh year, you have to forgive people their debts. And, and here, you can go free. Whatever you owed me is paid up. And then at seven times seven, so on the 49th year, on the year of Jubilee, year number 50, then people get back their possession. So because I'm teaching you redemption, I'm teaching you, I'm going to force you to forgive people their debts so that I'm going to force you to forgive as I forgive you. And that's why Jesus put that in the prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The, if I want God to, and, and one of his parables is about the mass, you know, a guy who, his master forgave him this huge debt he couldn't pay, and then he couldn't, didn't forgive this guy that owed him 25 cents. And so he was put in jail. And, and God says, that's what I'm going to do. If you don't forgive other people and, redeem, and, and let them free of what they owe, you, you know what I mean, owe you emotionally or whatever it is, then I'm going to, I will punish you. Anguish will come upon you in whatever way. Uh, and then when they didn't do that, when they didn't do that to the land, then God took them off the land. I'm going to let that land rest for 70 years because I told you to do it every seven years to let it rest and you didn't. So it's going to rest for 70 years because I win in the end. I get my way. I'm not asking you to do stuff. Oh, I hope they do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it happen. You can either cooperate with me or not. But I'm, what I'm putting in motion, I watch over my word to perform it. So if I'm saying that land's going to rest, it's going to rest. So uh, in whatever way, I'm going to get my way. Then he talks about the feast, the Sabbaths and the feasts. And he's just painting the picture of you were sinners. Don't forget you were in Egypt. Then the Spirit came down on Pentecost. And then the Feast of Tabernacles, that finding that in-gathering feast, is now you're taking that Spirit and you're, and you're giving it out to the world. So these are the important things. I'm putting them in the law as statutes to teach you about my ways. Okay, so today at 11, I will be, 11.15 it'll turn out to be, I will be teaching uh, on the book of 1 Samuel um, uh, at my church. If you just happen to want to listen in, we're in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Uh, and for the rest of you, I'll see you on Wednesday. We're in the book of John, John chapter 15. Okay, thanks so much. I appreciate that you take the time to listen in. Uh, God bless you.